Hi, this is Dr. Beltre from Beltre Bariatrics, and I want to be speaking about complications from the different uh, bariatric procedures. I hope this answers uh, questions about that you may have about the complications associated with the obesity surgery, and uh, this explanation, of course, are based on a lot of the questions that my own patients uh, ask me, and on a consent that, that uh, was put out by the ASMBS, the American Society of Metabolic and Bariatric Surgeons, that I use to explain to, to my patients. So bariatric surgery is surgery, right? It's like any surgical procedures. There are certain types of, of uh, complications that are inherent to any surgical procedures. Uh, number one, bleeding, right? Uh, bleeding is uh, one to uh, five percent, and there's different places where you can uh, bleed. You can bleed from the skin incisions itself, right? And then you can bleed inside as well. You can bleed from where the ports are placed. We, when we do laparoscopic surgery, you place a special tube through the through the skin and the muscle you can uh, bleed from there what i i find that most of uh, most of the time you bleed from what we call the, the staple line if you refer to the uh, gastric sleeve uh, uh, drawing here uh, the the sleeve gastrectum has a long staple line right the cut long cut line here and you will tend to um, bleed or ooze some blood from those uh, staple lines. Uh, if it is a, a gastric uh, bypass, um, likewise, you can also bleed from the staple line as well as from the connection uh, here called an anastomosis. And why this happens? Well, because we use blood thinners, right? We use Lovenox, right? Individuals that are, that are morbidly obese uh, tend to have a higher risk for blood clots. These blood clots can go to your lungs and cause pulmonary embolism and so on. And we do use uh, blood thinners that we give before the surgery. And we continue after the surgery, if, if we can, to uh, control the incidence of this blood clot. Right? The most talked about potential risk, right? If you if you Google risk from the gastric sleeve or the gastric bypass, the first thing that's going to come out is a staple line leak or an anastomotic uh, leak. That is the first thing that comes up because that is the most talked about potential risk. Uh, basically, again, um, if you uh, refer from, to the gastric sleeve, you can have a, if there's poor uh, healing of tissue, staples don't take well, you can uh, have a leak up here. Uh, that leak can turn into an infection. You may or may not need additional surgery, but it needs to be treated with antibiotics and so on and, and so forth. That is a, a, a staple line leak from the gastric sleeve. If you talk about the gastric bypass, you can have a, a leak from the bypass stomach, yes, but that's more rare. You can have a leak from that connection here that was made from the small stomach into uh, the intestine. That's called an anastomotic uh, leak. Chances of leak is 0.5 to 3%, still uh, very low, but we take them very seriously. So there's, there are things that we do to help prevent these leaks from occurring. Number one, we leave drains in when we feel it's adequate. We, we leave drains in and uh, these drains don't prevent leaks, but if someone were to get a leak, it may prevent them from getting very sick from the leak. Uh, number two, we do x-ray called upper GI series that we do the next day in order to make sure this, uh, that there's no leaks. So we do it in upper GI the following day or the the day before the patient leaves the hospital to make sure everything looks fine. So the, those are anastomotic leaks. Next, heart attacks. You have surgicals on the anesthetics and the anesthesia, uh, of course, can affect our heart. And therefore, there is a very low incidence of heart attacks. Very low. In fact, I don't even remember having a patient have a heart attack after bariatric uh, procedures. So what do we do? Uh, well, you know, I know there are, there are patients out there because of their obesity, they suffer not only pulmonary issues like uh, COPD and, and sleep apnea, but they also have heart problems, right? But we make sure that our patients are seen by a cardiologist, make sure they have all types of tests done to make sure that the heart can withstand uh, the surgical procedure or the anesthetic. And that's how we, we go around that. We try to prevent one, really. So far, I believe we are very successful in, in, in that term. The, the next potential risk is bowel obstructions. You don't get bowel obstruction with the sleeves. It's very rare, right? Bowel obstruction is more the gastric bypass or the duodenal uh, switch. With uh, the gastric uh, bypass, we are working with the small intestines. There are certain spaces that are created, if you will, when you do a gastric bypass. Like now you bring in small intestine over the colon and the stomach to be attached to the small stomach here. Well, the spaces that are created now 
here, right? They didn't exist before. There's a space now between the colon and the small intestines here, uh, or the stomach and the small intestine there. And those can be potential sites where intestines can go in and cause a bowel obstruction. We close those, right? We close the, the weakness here that's created and the weakness that is created here underneath the colon to prevent a bowel obstruction. But remember also there's bowel obstruction from adhesion, from scar tissues that uh, can occur. Uh, bowel obstructions is very low incidence, about 1% or less that can get a bowel obstruction after a gastric bypass. So it's very rare. The next potential risk I want to talk is about DVT, D-venous thrombosis. These are blood clots that can form in your legs, go to your lungs, become pulmonary embolisms. And remember, when I, I briefly uh, explained at the beginning that we give you Lovenox, right? Lovenox is a blood thinner. Uh, it's a blood thinner that we use in, uh, in, in medicine in general, including bariatric surgery that we give to our patients before the surgery. And we continue uh, afterwards to prevent these blood clots. Any surgical procedure can make you prone to a blood clot, right? Anything, child labor, C-sections, gallbladder, hernias, anything where you have any type of procedures and you are bedridden, you're not walking, you're not being more active, that can make you prone to a blood clot. Sitting in an airplane for a long time can make you prone to blood clots, right? The immobility plus surgery equals a blood clot. So this is why we give you the lavano. This is why uh, nurses are getting you up and moving uh, very quickly after the surgery uh, to prevent the blood clots. This is why we put these special stockings in your legs, right? Called, called SCD, the compression stocking. This that can massage your leg kind of thing that to keep the flow of blood going even when you are laying in bed or sitting down it's all to prevent blood clots the risks that i just mentioned are the early risks now i'm going to talk about risks that can occur maybe weeks or months later that don't happen right away the first one is a, uh, a stricture a stricture is a narrowing. You see more strictures and ulceration in gastric bypass patient, right? Remember with the gastric bypass, we have to make a connection here between the stomach, the new small stomach and the intestines. And uh, that connection can scar and become very small to the point where only liquids can go through. That can be a stricture. Sometimes it can get so small that nothing can go through, right? And uh, normally strictures present, normally patients come to me and say, hey, uh, Dr. Belcher, I'm doing fine with liquids, but when I eat something solid, I feel it gets stuck there, right? That can be a stricture. Sometimes they just go to the emergency department because they can they vomit everything, including liquids, right? That can be a stricture. The strictures, you see more in the gastric bypass and this connection here. There are certain individuals that can get more strictures than others. Smokers tend to get more strictures, right? Because smokers can get ulcers here, called marginal ulcers, right? This is why I don't like to do bypasses in, in smokers unless I know they're going to stop for sure, because otherwise you will most likely get a marginal ulcer. Those ulcers here with scar tissue, and you get a stricture. How are strictures are treated? Most of the time, strictures are just treated uh, non-surgically, right? You have an endoscopy, an EGD by the gastroenterologist who puts in a special balloon catheter in there and kind of blows it up and opens it up. And uh, sometimes you need one session, some Sometimes it's two. Uh, if you need more than two, then you have to think about maybe going in and redoing that connection surgically. But most of the time you can treat it with just a dilation. The other potential chronic types of um, issues that can happen with obesity procedures is vitamin deficiencies, right? We, I stress a lot, and most bariatric surgeons stress a lot about taking your multivitamins, right? To prevent a vitamin deficiency. The gastric sleeve is the one that tends to give you the least amount of vitamin uh, deficiency. With the gastric sleeve, of course, we're just working on the stomach. We're not bypassing anything, right? So therefore, anything that goes through the sleeve, you can absorb with uh, no uh, problems. Uh, we talk about vitamin deficiency. You're talking about more the duodenal switch and the gastric bypass. The duodenal switch being the highest one with the highest potential for vitamin deficiency, but with the bypass as well. Remember with the bypass and duodenal switch, you bypass the upper part of the intestine where certain things are absorbed. For example, iron is absorbed in the upper part of the intestines. B12 uh, needs to be coupled with a special protein made in the stomach for you to absorb it downstream. Uh, therefore, B12 deficiency can occur, which are some of the most two most common vitamin deficiency. But we do stress that our patients would take the multivitamins, maybe iron and B12 extra if they need to after a bypass or do the no switch. I also recommend my patients to take a bariatric multivitamins, even with a uh, gastric sleeve. So that's vitamin deficiency. Of course, the reason we want to prevent vitamin deficiency is because you can get anemia from iron deficiency. 
and, and B12 uh, deficiencies. And of course, long term, you can get osteoporosis from uh, calcium, vitamin D3 and uh, calcium deficiency. Also some potential risk biohabit changes, which is it's rare about habit changes means that some people may have diarrhea, some may have uh, constipation after the surgery, depending. But uh, bowel habits changes usually kind of tend to correct themselves uh, uh, over time. Internal hernias, I briefly spoke about internal hernias. Remember when I mentioned about potential risk for bowel obstructions from uh, weakness areas that are form when you do a gastric bypass, for example, those are internal hernias. Hernias that occur inside, you don't see these hernias, but they are inside, they call internal hernias. And like I said, we normally close those spaces after the procedures to prevent those. Pregnancy, right? Um, we'll talk about briefly about pregnancy. Anyone that's getting a bariatric procedure should not get pregnant or plan to not to get pregnant for at least a year, right? You gotta wait about a year or so before you can get pregnant uh, after uh, surgery. I have had several patients get pregnant six months, four months after a sleep, for example. What happens is that you will start losing weight uh, for sure. You, know, you will start losing weight. The metabolic effect of the pregnancy now takes over and, and, and over the metabolic effect of the surgery and you start losing weight. If you're lucky after you give birth, you know, you can start losing weight again, but most likely uh, not. It would be just as hard as anybody else to lose weight. You will still have the portion control, though. You still have that portion control there, but the metabolic effect of the surgery is gone. So you've got you to wait uh, about a year or so uh, before you can get pregnant after any uh, bariatric, any of the bariatric procedures. Of course, uh, the pregnancy, uh, you're eating smaller now, right? So we have to be very careful. We have to follow you very careful. Make sure you're taking your multivitamins, make sure you, you're eating enough to maintain the pregnancy. Gallbladder issues. There, there are two states in the human body that causes you to make gallstones, right? There is this pregnancy is one of them and losing a lot of weight can make you form stones. 15% of patients that form stones can develop symptoms of gallbladder. What are the symptoms of the gallbladder of gallstones? Pain in the right upper side after you eat, uh, bloating and so on and so forth. Sometimes the pain is in the middle of the stomach. You do an ultrasound with this patient, you find that it's, it's gallbladder. Nausea well, after eating can also be one of the symptoms with, the gall, with gallstones. And it's just a simple matter of removing the gallbladder with the, with the stones. Weight regain can be a potential risk, right? Uh, there's no perfect procedure. There. There's no uh, surgery that a human being cannot defeat. So weight regain can be an issue. And weight regain with any bariatric procedure, we're talking about 20, 30%. Some surgeons believe it's higher than that. It's be as high as 40%, right? Or the individuals can regain the weight. Normally weight regain occurs, usually begins to occur three to five years later. All right, everybody loses weight, it seems, right after the surgery. But three to five years later, there are individuals that can begin to uh, gain some other weight. Sometimes because the surgery failed, right? You know, the, the, the pouch is very big and you can eat more. The sleeve was not done correctly and it's now very large because too much of the stretchy part, the fundus is, was left. That's not what I normally see. And most bariatric surgeons will tell you that's not what we normally see. We see more the individual's fault at regaining uh, the weight. And, and you, can, you, know, you cannot blame anyone. The truth is in some individuals, their appetites come back and now they're craving bad things, you know, the sugary stuff, the, the carbs and so on and so forth, the refined carbs. And as a result, they can uh, start gaining uh, weight. These patients can never sit down and consume like a whole meal, right? They still eat very little, but what happens is that they end up eating multiple times throughout the day because they're hungry. So yeah, you eat a little bit now, but an hour later you eat again and then another hour later. At the end of the day, you're eating a lot because you can put all those together and it's like you had a large meal. And that's how most individuals can uh, regain their way uh, back. There are ways uh, to address this. And you know, I will make a separate videos about weight regain and, and, and uh, how you treat it. Then the opposite can be true, right? Losing too much weight, right? So, so individuals can lose uh, too much weight. Normally what I find, patient loses uh, too much weight is because they either, if it's a, they have a stricture, right? They're not able to eat, they eat and they vomit. And the strictures can happen in the sleeve, or the gastric bypass, it can also happen in the duodenal switch. Uh, over time, they eat, they vomit half of what they eat and they can lose too much weight. Also in a duodenal switch, if the patient is not able to tolerate the amount of testing that was bypassed and they can have a chronic diarrhea can lead to excessive weight and those things can be corrected uh, with uh, surgery. Last uh, one, temporary hair loss, right? Yes, uh, any bariatric or, or metabolic procedures can cause temporary hair loss. From what I have I've observed, I would say about 40% of female patients. 
hardly happens to male patients, although it can, but and when it does, it tends to be a little bit more mild. I see it more in female patients. I would say about 40% of my patients, we get uh, some form of a temporary hair loss. And basically, what it means is that when you comb your hair, when you wash your hair, you see more hair on the comb. If it's gonna happen, it usually begins to happen four to six months after the surgery. And um, there are things that you can do. Number one, I ensure my patients are taking the multivitamins, including supplements like biotin helps a lot. And that you're taking your protein. You want to take at least at least 40 grams of protein daily, 40, 60 grams of protein daily, so that you can lose the weight healthier and uh, decrease the chance of uh, hair loss. But I would say in most patients, hair loss is temporary and they can eventually start growing hair again. I hope that this video helps you in terms of the different types of things that can occur after surgery. These are rare events and by far, most of these things can be uh, corrected with surgery or with uh, medications. I believe that the weight loss procedures, definitely the benefit outweighs the potential risk. I mean, we're talking about getting rid of type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, sleep apnea, uh, losing weight in the process of being healthy, increasing your lifespan as a result of losing uh, the weight. And that definitely outweighs any potential uh, risk. Like I said, these risks are usually are, can be taken care of. Thank you, and I hope this is uh, helpful to you guys.